In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I am. Brother Woodward, we're grateful God sent a Canadian here on our nation's holiday for you to preach the word of the Lord. Louisiana loves you. He needs no introduction. Will you welcome the man of God as he comes? Good morning, Louisiana. What a beautiful and meaningful day it is. And yeah, I'm from Canada. But I'm sure glad to be in Louisiana on the 4th of July, I can tell you that. God has raised up this nation and he hasn't raised it up so that we could be blessed financially and materially and increase our standard of living. He's blessed America so we could increase our standard of giving. God's raised up this exceptional nation to bless the world. And you have blessed the world, but it's not over yet until the last second of the last minute of the last hour of the last day before the rapture happens god has his hand on america for a purpose and i am so very grateful to be here i feel um such a powerful witness of the holy ghost in this camp meeting i knew jesus would be here obviously but he's exceptionally here among us this week. What a, what a profound and powerful word we heard from the man of God last night. What a, a, an amazing uh, communion service. And I thank God for the miracles that were done and the lives that were changed last night. I, I'd like to start this morning um, before we sit down or read a text or do anything else, if you would just fill the atmosphere and seed the clouds of this day with your praise and your worship unto God. Everybody front to back and side to side and balcony to floor. Thank you, Jesus. I worked on Bible class for this morning all day yesterday. And when I got back to my room, I worked late last night. <sighs> Jesus doesn't pay much attention to how hard I work on stuff. Got up early this morning and the Lord said, mm -mm. and uh, no, that, uh, 
but Jesus, this is really good stuff. And then Brother Shearing got up here and when he started heading into where he was going, uh, I thought, oh, okay, so that's, that's the vein, that's, that's why. And then I thought, he's going to preach my thing if he keeps on. And he didn't. He got so close. Um, but I do feel confident in, in what I want to share with you because um, I believe we're in the purpose and the will of God this morning. Yes. I'm, I'm not just talking endlessly and, and just randomly here. I'm feeling my way along in the spirit. I believe today is a day of destiny. I mean, we're here together in this great camp and it's the... feel like God is reaching down in this camp to give uh, end time strength to his people. God is not unaware of what you're walking through. God is not unaware of what is unfolded in your family. God is not unaware of your sickness. He's not unaware of the issues. He's not unaware. He's closer to you than you think or sense. The songwriter a few years ago wrote, he's as close as the mention of his name. And he is. And uh, so I'm not just rambling here because I just want to back up and give one more run at lifting up our hands and our voice in this sanctuary, and then we'll get to the lesson. But if you just lift that up one more time, Jesus is here. He's here for you. He's here for destiny. He's here for purpose. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, and I know almost all of you are, would you use that gift God put inside you? And would you pray in the Holy Ghost for a moment over this day? I worship you, God. I worship you, God. Slide into your seat, would you please? And then clap your hands and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. And Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My subject for your consideration in Bible class this morning is God's guarantee. There are some things God says in His Word that are conditional promises, there are other things that are a rock solid guarantee. And there are some that kind of hit the balance in between the two because of how we respond to what God's word has said. I start with a familiar verse. I thought Brother Sheeran would hit this this morning. He was almost there. A lot of people have this pinned on a fridge magnet. They pick it out of a Bible promise box. It's on a plaque. They've memorized it. They can say it. They can quote it. And they don't believe it any more than anything. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know, somebody say, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Brother Jackson said the other night, and he's absolutely correct, it doesn't say for our good. You may not perceive it as good, but God still promised it will work together for good to those that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, Paul can't leave anything alone because he's so deep and profound and brilliant. And so Paul backs up the great theologian of the first century. He backs up and he explains why this guarantee from God works. Because this guarantee doesn't always look like it's working. It just doesn't. 
And a lot of people, you can tell that they can quote this, but they don't believe it. Because when they get into a situation in life that they don't like, they begin to whine. I was teaching through the, the books that Paul wrote to the young men he mentored, Timothy and Titus and uh, Philemon. And I was teaching through those books at the church uh, a couple, three years ago and, and got to the qualifications for deacons and elders. And, and, and it said, not given to wine. And I stopped right up and I told the church, that word really needs an H in it. Because really, God's people and God's leaders should not be given to wine all the time. Now, Paul backs up and he explains how this works. This is why God's guarantee works. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then he says, moreover... Whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. And then he gives us his punchline. What shall we say then to these things? Here's what we say to all of these things that happen to us in life. And here's what we say looking at our lives and then looking at our great God at the same time. Here's what we say. Here's Paul's punchline. If a God like that is for me, who do you think you are that you think you can be against me? Now, now Paul uses this word that's gotten punched around and misinterpreted and, 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 and preached terribly. Uh, this word predestinate, predestination. And there is such a thing in theology as predestination, but it gets misinterpreted. Um, predestination, a lot of people today preach that God predestinates people. Uh, and so uh, he likes you, so you're going to heaven. It doesn't matter what you do bad. Uh, he doesn't like you, you're going to hell. It doesn't matter what you do good. Our God is not that unjust. Our God is not that unfair. Our God doesn't operate like that. And his word indicates that he doesn't operate like that. And yet this word predestinate or predestination hangs over scripture. And so if God doesn't predestinate you and you and you to an eternal destiny that you can't change, then what in the world does predestination mean? And here's what it is. It's very simple. While God does not pick out individuals and say, it doesn't matter what you do, I've already chosen your eternal destiny. God doesn't do that. But here's what he does. God has predestinated groups of individuals for an eternal destiny. You see, there's a group called the sinners and their eternal destiny is hell. Their eternal destiny is eternal separation from God. Their eternal destiny is eternal punishment. But you don't have to be in that group. You need to do everything you can possibly do. Pay any price you need to pay. Break off any habit or any relationship you need to break off. Take you and your family, everybody you love, all the friends you can reach, and get yourself out of that group because that group is going into eternal damnation. You don't want to be part of that group. But the best news and the real news and the only news of Scripture is this. There's another group. You don't have to spend your life and go into eternity in the group called the sinners. There's a group called the saints. Aren't you glad that you transferred your allegiance from this group to that group? And it was by the blood of Jesus Christ that your transfer was paid. You are now in covenant with the name of Jesus through the waters of of your baptism. You are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. The devil is on his way down. We're on our way up. He has no future. We have an eternal future. That's what Paul means when he says predestinate. Now we could do pastors a, a real favor we could eliminate a lot of pastoral time, effort, energy, stress. Yes, because we have precedent in the book of Acts for people receiving the Holy Ghost before they're baptized in Jesus' name. We do have that precedent. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen. So pastors could do themselves a favor if we just got you to repent 
And then we prayed you through to the Holy Ghost. The minute we got you talking in tongues, we took you to the baptistry, baptized you in Jesus' name, and held you under. <laughs> Until the bubbles stopped. <laughs> go straight to heaven. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. No pastoral counseling. No church problems. It's amazing. When pastors fantasize, some of them have a list in order of people they'd prefer that that... Never mind. Not your pastor. Other pastors. The reason we didn't do that is because God has a purpose for you still being alive. If you're breathing, you are a construction site for the Holy Ghost. And here's why you're still breathing. For whom he did foreknow, he knew you'd be part of his kingdom. He predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son. God is working on your life every single day to make you into his image. Because as you are made into his image, you're obviously more like him in your actions, your reaction, your talk, your walk. And so you become a more effective agent for God's kingdom on this earth. So God is interested. He has a vested interest in making you into his image as you live for him. That's his lifelong goal for you that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then Paul paints this amazing theological picture. Here's his picture. He's got the church back here in time, and we are walking with God, and we are walking toward our future eternity. But then he, he paints this. God is in eternity future. God's time doesn't matter to God. He's everywhere present, nowhere absent, including every time period. He's the one who is and who was and who is to come, which is really awesome because that means that this morning you can pray in the present because you're limited to the present. You can't go back and change your past and you can't go ahead and change your future. But when you pray in the present to the God who is and was and is to come, time doesn't matter to him. He lives in eternity. You can pray here in the present this morning he can go back into your past and he can change what the devil meant to kill you and he can turn it around and give you a testimony furthermore while you're praying in the present God can slip into your future and he can knock down mountains and bring up valleys and make a way where right now there is no way So Paul paints this picture of this God who's in eternity future and he's looking back at us and it says the ones he foreknew, he knew you'd be part of his church. He predestinated the church. So if you're in the church, you're part of this construction project. God is building us, making us, forming us, conforming us into his image. And he's in eternity future. And he's looking back at the church saying, Church, I knew you'd be in my kingdom. I knew you'd love me. I knew you'd serve me. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to justify you. I'm going to sanctify you. Someday I'm going to glorify you. But look what Paul does. He puts it all in the past. Them he justified, he also sanctified. Them he sanctified, he also glorified. See, here's what Paul's saying. It's a done deal with God. There's not a devil in hell that can pull you out of God's kingdom. Only you can make that choice. If you're in his kingdom, God is in eternity future saying, come on, church, I've already paved the road. I've already made everything available for you. All you got to do is walk with me. I'm in the future. You see, God already has seen the rapture. He dwells in eternity. He already knows who's going. He knows you're going. He's in heaven. He's cheering you on saying, I know you're going to get through this little issue because I've already seen you on the other side of this issue. <laughs> and then he says, with a God like that? On our side, devil, who do you think you are to try to be against us? Now, God does not, and Brother Jackson said it, he does not promise us that all things will be good. 
Now, Brother Sheeran talked a lot about food this morning, and I suddenly realized two things. He is really a funny guy, and I miss breakfast, which suddenly was not as funny anymore. God doesn't promise us that all things will be good. Now, here's my answer to Brother Sheeran, but he does promise us that all things will work together for good. Take that, Trent Sheeran. Now, I can't cook, but I understand the principle of cooking. On the screen are the ingredients of a chocolate cake. They do not all taste the same. I taught on this years ago. It must have been, oh my goodness, 15, 16 years ago at the church at home. And we were sitting around tables. And I had on the tables the ingredients of a cake in little containers. And at a certain point in the lesson, I just said, pop open those containers and everybody help yourself. And all of a sudden, the sugar people were experiencing a depth of anointing and energy. And, and the raw egg people didn't know what to do. And the flour people, there was a cloud of something around their table. The baking soda people, they didn't like life very much. You see, not all those ingredients taste the same. You don't experience them all the same. But when they're mixed together and heat is applied, the end result is something you would like to eat. And so just like that, here's what God does in your life. He doesn't promise every day you're going to jump out of bed and feel this surge of the Holy Ghost in the first two minutes your feet are on the floor. Here's what he says. Some days will be sad. Some days will be bad. Some will be good. Some will have joy. Some will have sorrow. I didn't promise everything in your life will be good. Here's what I promise. When you get to the end of your month, your year, your season, when you get to the end of your life and you turn around and look back down that road, here's what you're going to say. It wasn't all good, but it all worked together for good. Do I have a witness in Bible class this morning? When I walked through that trial, I didn't like it. I don't want it again. I wouldn't go through it again. I, I don't want it again, but I can say I've never been closer to God than since I got through that trial. That's how this works. So God's goal is that we be conformed to the image of his son or that we be become like Jesus. God's guarantee, folks, is that he will mold and shape us like a potter would shape clay on a potter's wheel. And he will do that not just on your good days. He will do that on your bad days. He will do that not just when you're feeling a surge of the Holy Ghost and anointing. He will do that when you can't feel a thing and the heavens feel like brass and it's an effort to pray. He still has a guarantee that he will be working all things for good. Now, he's going to make us into his image. So that begs a question. What is his image? What is Jesus like? And the answer is very simple. Jesus is like the fruit of the Spirit. If you have more of the fruit of the Spirit, you have more evidence that Jesus is living in your life. You were created to be a vessel for the Holy Ghost to dwell in, and that is why your life will quickly get out of hand and spin out of control if you refuse to give Jesus control. I don't care how long you've been a church member, if you don't walk with God consistently, your life will spiral out of control very quickly. Because when you don't give him control, you leave your flesh in charge by default. And then your flesh starts dictating your thoughts, your desires, your behaviors, your actions, and your reactions. And the Bible has a term for that. It calls it the works of the flesh. Let me read this to you from the New Living Translation. This is Galatians chapter 5, beginning at 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature... The results are very clear. Here's what happens. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. And Paul says, let me tell you again, as I have before, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit 
in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. In other words, you don't have to pass law to make them happen because it's a work of the Spirit. And there's no limit to what the Spirit can do. Don't, don't, don't get saying, well, I, that's just the way I am. No, that's just the way you were. Don't use that as a cop-out. Now, I want you to note that the works of the flesh, they're plural. It's the works of the flesh. So just because you say, well, I don't do all those things. I'm not sexually immoral. Yeah, but do you have outbursts of anger? It's the works of the flesh. Just because you haven't done all of them doesn't mean you get a pass. Just one of the works of the flesh will destroy God's image in your life. So you can't say, well, I, I just have an issue here. No, God wants to root out all of those issues. That's why he's left you here and he's working on you. But while the works of the flesh are plural, so you don't get a pass just because you say, well, I, I don't do all of those things. One of them will take you down. But notice that the fruit of the Spirit is singular. Now there's a point here. Some people, their personality it makes it easier for it to look like they've got some parts of the fruit of the Spirit. But it doesn't mean you're okay just because you've got some of this together. It's the fruit of the Spirit, singular. You don't get to say, well, I'm joyful or I'm peaceful, but I don't have that other stuff. It's the fruit of the Spirit. You need all of it. The Holy Ghost grows all of it at the same time in your life through your circumstances. The fruit of the Spirit is singular. See, there are people that they, you know, you look at them and you think, well, they're so peaceful. They're not peaceful. They're just lazy. <laughs> Go in peace. <laughs> you look at other people, you say, they're so joyful. They're just simple. I'm moving on. Um, now, theologians call speaking in tongues the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But I would say that while speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost, you could make an equal case that the fruit of the Spirit is the continuing evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Just because you talked in tongues 30 years ago, if you're not becoming more like Jesus every week you live, you're doing this wrong. Now, it's God's guarantee that his process will work in your life if you will let it work. Not all parts of the process are going to be pleasant. Not all of them will be quick or easy to go through. And here's the thing. You will not appreciate all the tools God uses in his toolbox as he works on your life. Some of his tools are confusing. Some of his methods are frustrating. But we have God's guarantee that this process will work if we let it work. Now, what are some of the ways God uses to conform us into his image? What are some of the tools in his toolbox that he uses? Well, one thing is right here. God uses his word to work on us. And when we get in a camp meeting like this and you hear the, these great men of God stand in this pulpit and they begin to preach to us and they begin to, to let the word work and the word convicts and, and the word directs and, and the word corrects, we need to pay attention to that because that's the word building his image in our lives. God doesn't just use the word, he uses his spirit. You don't get a pass just because there's not a thou shalt not in the Bible. If the Holy Ghost taps you on the shoulder and says you shouldn't go there or you shouldn't do that or you need to avoid that, you are responsible because the Holy Ghost is working on you to make you into his image. I would love it if God would just use his word and his spirit to mold me into his image. I would love that because God also has another tool in his toolbox. It's the sandpaper in his toolbox. It's called people. 
I don't know how you talk to Jesus, but I have said to Jesus, just once, couldn't you use some normal people to sand the rough edges off of me? God uses people. Now, sometimes people inspire us, but sometimes people irritate us. And God sends people. My, my grandfather on my mother's side, his name was Maurice, and he used to say, the more I see of people, the more I love my horse. <laughs> I will confess that there have been days pastoring when I thought my grandfather had some real wisdom. God doesn't just use people, he also uses this. Because at least with people, sometimes they go away. You can go to sleep and forget them. You can go on vacation and get a break from them. But God also uses this one. It's in his toolbox. It's circumstances. Circumstances are with you 24-7. You never get away from those. Because you can go to sleep... Your refrigerator can be broken when you go to bed and you can wake up the next morning and somebody stole it. Circumstances can get worse without you doing anything. And here's what God promised, brothers and sisters. No matter if it's His Word correcting us, His Spirit directing us, no matter whether it's people inspiring us to be better or irritating us and chafing against us, whether it's circumstances that cause us to pray and seek His face, God promised that I will use all those things and I will work them together for good. Second Corinthians, Paul said... For our light affliction, you think it's heavy, you think it's terrible, if you could see the other side of it, your light affliction that's so heavy now, when you get to heaven and you look back on what you walk through, your light affliction, which is but for a moment, it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You get in heaven, your toes touch the streets of gold, and you're going to look back at all the heavy things you walk through, and you're going to say that wasn't so bad in your face devil I made it through all of that and Jesus used that to prepare me for his eternal kingdom so God's guarantee is that he has a purpose behind every problem you encounter every problem now the storms of life happen to us for different reasons not all storms are the same Jonah got in a storm because he was out of the will of God. He wouldn't go to Nineveh. He got in a storm because he was out of the will of God. Paul got in a storm because other people on that boat were out of the will of God. Paul said, don't let loose, don't set sail, don't go out on the sea. And they said, no, we're going. He got in a storm because other people were out of the will of God. And the disciples, guess why they got in a storm? They got in a storm because they were in the middle of the will of God. Jesus said, go to the other side. They go to the other side. They're doing what Jesus told them. And they get in this fierce storm on the middle of the Sea of Galilee. So they got in a storm because they were in God's will. Here's what I know. No matter what caused it, God can use it for good for you. I don't care if you made a mistake, someone else made a mistake. I don't care if it was just life. I don't care if it's an attack of the devil. I don't care what it is. No matter what caused it, God can use it and he can bring good from it. You may not see the good today. You might not see the good this week. But you will turn around someday. And if you don't on earth, you definitely will in heaven. And say, God, that was a light affliction. It only lasted for a moment. But look at the eternal weight of glory. Now here's the deal. This is, this is really just practical. So you forgive me. It's not very profound. But, but you can expect four kinds of problems in your life. Number one, trials. Somebody say trials. trials. Now, I'm going to need your help here on the old campground this morning. Yes, it's July the 4th, so you should be waving something anyway today. So. Somebody say trials. trials. Now, trials come about as a result of us living in a sin-cursed world. 
But the truth is that trials are actually allowed by God in your life. The devil can't just randomly walk up to you and just put anything on you that he wants. He cannot do it. That's scripturally, theologically impossible. You are a child of God. You are filled with the Holy Ghost. He has to get permission. If the devil had to get permission to attack Job in the Old Testament, pre-Pentecost, you want to believe that the devil has to go into God and say, okay, can I have permission to do this to them. The devil, the devil can't kill you. He can't give you a disease that's going to kill you. He can't put you in a sickness that's going to kill you. He can't put you in a car wreck that's going to kill you. He cannot do it because you are in the hand of God. If the devil could do that, we'd all be dead. There'd be nobody here on the campground. He would have had us all have a car wreck on the way here. Do you think the devil wanted you in this tabernacle this morning lifting up praise to God? Absolutely not. If he could have taken you out, he would have taken you out, but he hasn't taken you out so since we're here and since he couldn't why don't we give praise to the God who keeps us yes the devil is not the boss of me he's not the Lord of me his voice means nothing in my life Jesus voice means everything in my life Help me. Somebody say, trials come from God. Would you point at the ceiling? Say, they come from God. God didn't create them, but God allows them. So they come from Him. Now, it'd be wonderful if all you had to deal with in your life was trials, but you also have to deal with this. Somebody say, temptations. Temptations don't come from God. God can't be tempted with evil and sin, and He doesn't tempt you with all of that. Temptations don't come from God. So where do temptations come from? Would you point down at the floor? Temptations come from the devil. It's the devil that gives you. And and temptations. God will use trials to draw you close to him. Do you know why the devil tempts you? It's to pull you off track. It's to pull you away from God. It's to separate you from God's purpose in your life. Temptations come from the devil. I would love it. If all I had to deal with was trials that come from God and temptations that come from the devil, I would absolutely love that. I could probably figure that out. But then I have to deal with this one. Somebody say trespasses. Now, a trespass today means exactly what a trespass did in Bible times and vice versa. If you see uh, private property, no trespassing, and you ignore the sign and you ignore the fence and you ignore the boundary and you walk over into that person's property, you have trespassed. A trespass is when you ignore the boundary, you walk beyond it, and, and, and you infringe on somebody else's space. That's a trespass. So we mean it in the theological sense. If you break God's law, you ignore the boundaries, you walk beyond them, you go into sin, you have trespassed, you've ignored God's commandments, and you've infringed on God's rights. But that's not what I'm talking about, because there's another sense of trespass in the Bible. When somebody else wades into your life unwanted, uninvited, and they wreak all kinds of havoc, cause all kinds of chaos, cause all kinds of sadness and grief and turmoil, and then walk away, waltz off, and leave you to deal with all the chaos they just unleashed, what did they just do? They trespassed against you. They infringed on your space and they got in your face and they messed up in your life some kind of situation and then they just go on and live life as if they're okay and you are left to deal with the carnage and you're left to deal with the issues that that person created. It wasn't the devil. It wasn't God. It was them. Would you point like this? Say trespasses come from others. Please do not poke anyone. Please do not point at anyone. Especially if they are your spouse. Please do not point at them or jab in their direction. Trespasses come from others. So would you help me here? Somebody say trials come from God. Temptation 
comes from the devil. Trespasses come from others. That's a lot to handle. That's a lot to deal with. No wonder Paul said, now all things work together for good. He didn't promise you all things would be good. You get other people coming in and out of your life, it's not always going to be good. And it would be lots to handle if that's all there was, but there's one more. (laughs) Because there's one more person left. If it's not God, and it's not the devil, and it's not others, there's one more. Somebody say troubles. Do you know where trouble comes from? Somebody go like this. Say, trouble comes from me. Stop blaming the devil for everything when it's you. Stop blaming the church and the pastor and the saints for everything when it's you. Stop blaming your sweet little wife or your husband or your kids or your parents when it's you. Sometimes you make the wrong turn and the wrong decision. And sometimes you get yourself in trouble. Troubles come from me. Now the reason I take time to just kind of lay that out is for this reason. Most people get stuck right there. Because God gives us a guarantee that all things will work together for good. But what he intends is for you to take the handbook that goes with his guarantee and handle every one of those problems according to what he said. Because you don't handle a trial like you handle a trespass. And you don't handle a temptation like you handle a trouble. There's a different response required for every one of those situations in the Word of God. Now here's his guarantee. If you'll do what my Word says when you encounter those, then my guarantee is 100%. All things work together for good. But if you don't handle it according to this, you are on your own. And so we got to learn. All of these situations demand a different response. And when we react wrongly, we want to blame the Bible, we want to blame the church, we want to blame God, we want to blame others, but it's our fault for not handling things according to the Word of God. So, so let's back up and take one more look. And Somebody say troubles come from me. Okay. Here, here's what the Bible says about trouble. There's many verses, but here's one. Psalm 31. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief, yea, my soul and my belly. I am racked with grief. I am racked with shame. I am racked with guilt. God, I did this to myself. God, have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Do you know sometimes you cause your own problems? And I I know you wouldn't believe this about me because after all, I'm teaching the Bible class. Surely I have my life in order, but I don't. Not all the time. Brother Tisdale's coming next. He does all the time, I'm sure. But I don't. So this is before and after. Okay, here's what we're going to do. But let me just talk about me for a second, okay? Here's the thing. I cause some of my own worst problems. For, for example, this is very s- silly, but, but my idea of vehicle maintenance is change the oil every five years, whether it needs it or not. I can't come to church and say, the devil attacked my car. The devil didn't attack my car. I attacked my car. I have a treasure. You, I, I don't know if you've ever heard me say this, but I have a treasure at home. It, it, it's a necktie. Uh, it's a beautiful necktie. And, and in fact, uh, I was wearing it several years ago at Sunday morning at our church. And it's just such a precious memory that I, I put it up in a, in a drawer. It's in my office. I could take you right to it. I put it up as a memorial before the Lord. It's just an ordinary necktie. But, but the knot is still tied that was around my neck that morning. Um, and I put it up as a memorial before the Lord because uh, that was the morning. Now, now, I have to tell you that I had always been a little arrogant and smug, I think. I had always made fun of people that caught articles of clothing in paper shredders before that Sunday morning. Always had. I just thought that was the height of stupidity that anybody could catch an article of their own clothing in a paper shredder. 
But on this particular morning, it was early on a Sunday. The guys weren't in. I was uh, going into the photocopier room at the church office to shred some paper. And as I leaned over, all the demons of hell reached up. No, they didn't. It was just that stupid machine. The next thing I heard was, "Ah!" and that thing had me by the neck and I was getting closer and closer and closer. They say if you're in a car accident that your life flashes before your eyes. It works with paper shredders. I could see the headlines as plain as day. Pastor strangled in church office on Sunday morning. Church congregation in mourning. Some rejoicing. I could see all the headlines. Here's what I did not do that Sunday morning. I did not get in the pulpit and say, Oh, church, the devil attacked me this morning. Because that wasn't the devil. If the devil was anywhere that morning, he was sitting on the desk in the general office laughing and slapping his leg. That wasn't the devil. That was me. Somebody say troubles come from me. So when you get in trouble... There's only one right response. Would you put your hands like this, please? Somebody say, repent. There's only one right response for trouble. If you caused it, if you did it, if you took the wrong turn, if you made the mistake, if you committed the sin, if you fractured the relationship, there's only one right response. You need to do what we preach to sinners. We tell sinners, no no equivocation whatsoever. You've got to turn yourself around and walk a different way. Repentance isn't just a privilege for sinners. Repentance is a privilege for saints. And if you get off track, you don't need to wallow there for six years. Just turn your little self around, repent, and you can get yourself out of trouble. And no matter what caused it, I know you made the mistake. I know you took the wrong turn. But here's what I know from God. If you'll handle it right, God can even take your worst mistake. And if you'll turn around, he'll turn it around. And he will somehow bring good out of it. But you got to handle it right. Somebody say temptations. Now temptations don't come from me. Temptations come from where? Come from the devil. So since temptations come from the devil, I don't handle them the same. You can repent when you get in temptation, but it's not going to work. Oh God, forgive me. You haven't sinned yet. Stop crying. Pick yourself up off the floor. You don't repent over a temptation. Here's what the Bible says. James said, submit yourselves therefore to God... Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Would you put your hands out like you were trying to stop a freight train and push? That's what you do when temptation comes at you. You don't repent because you haven't sinned yet. But here's what you also don't do. Don't collapse in a puddle of tears and say, oh, I can't handle this. You can't handle it. Stand up, square your shoulders, lock your feet, look the devil in the eye and say, you have no right in my life. You have no jurisdiction. I resist you in Jesus' name. Get out of my face. And if you'll handle it right, God will turn that around for you. And God will even use a time of temptation, if it's handled right, to bring good. You'll get stronger. You know the great thing about resisting temptation? It's hard today, but it will be easier next time. It'll be easier next week. Some of you precious new believers that are part of Louisiana District, number one, congratulations. You're part of one incredible family of God in the state of Louisiana. Congratulations. You sure made a good choice. But some of you precious new believers, you've looked around at your pastor and you've looked around at saints and you've looked around especially at those elders. And those elders just look like they marinated in the Bible. They looked like they walked with, with, with Samson and Noah and Moses and Abraham. and You know, you can just almost picture them on the pages of the Bible. They're not quite that old. You look at them and here's what you've said. I could never be like that. 
you're absolutely right. You could never be like that. But the Holy Ghost in you, working on you, oh yeah, you can be like that. That's why you're in God's kingdom. He's making you into his image. You know how they got like that? They handled life circumstances right. When they did something that messed them up and they committed a sin, they repented. That's why now they don't have to repent nearly as much as they used to because they've got used to just handling it quickly. They don't wallow in sin and go out on a detour and take a vacation from church once a year. They don't do that anymore. Here's why. Because they got used to repenting quickly and effectively and handling it according to the word of God. And now when the devil comes at them, they just think, ignore him and you're going to get there right now I know it's tough but here's what you need to learn when the devil when the enemy when all your issues and problems and struggles come in like a flood the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him you have a right to fight don't just sit there don't just stand there don't just lay on the ground and cry push him back Somebody say, temptation comes from the devil. So I need to resist. And then we come to this one. Somebody say, trespasses. Trespasses aren't from me. Trespasses don't come from the devil. Trespasses actually come from you. They come from others. And Jesus always tells us the very same thing. Every time he talks to us about dealing with a trespass, he always deals with it this way. He will tell stories. He told this story about a king. And this king loaned an unbelievably generous amount of money to a servant. And, and the servant wasted it, squandered it, lost it. And he can't pay the king back. The king deserves to get paid back. That's a legitimate debt. The servant owes the money. So the king should be paid back. And now the king has a choice to make. I can throw that man in jail. And I can even walk down. To, I'm the king. I can do whatever I want. I can walk down to the prison house every single day. And I can make sure they beat him every single day for what he didn't pay me back, for what he didn't do, for the evil he did against me, for the trespass he committed against me. And the king has that choice. But in every one of those stories Jesus tells, he tells it this way, that the king decided, you know what? I'm a king. <laughs> I've got a kingdom to run. I don't need to focus on that every day of my life. I could think about him every day. I could punish him every day. I could demand restitution every day. But the reality is, that person doesn't have enough resources to pay me back for what they did to me. If they started now and they work for the rest of their life, they don't have enough resources. Can I tell you, I meet people that are still angry with others who are dead and gone. And they're still angry at somebody that hurt them. And they couldn't apologize if they wanted to because they're not on this planet anymore. They died. And here you are suffering because of a trespass. And in every one of Jesus' stories, the king says, I'm a king. I've got a kingdom to run. I've got better things to do with my life than be occupied with something that happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And so with every one of Jesus' stories, the king tears up the dead, throws it away, lets the servant out of jail. You say, that's not fair. Because you just freed the servant. The king would say to you, no, I just freed myself. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to be burdened by it. I don't have to walk with it. It doesn't have to rest on my shoulders. I don't have to have nightmares about it. It's over. It's done. I ripped up the debt and threw it out. And that's why when Jesus talks about forgiveness, he always compares it to a debt. An unjust debt that is owed that you have a right 
to collect. You should be paid back. They owe you an apology. They should come on their hands and knees and say, I was wrong. They should cry. They should weep. They should grieve. They should repent. But the fact of the matter is, this is life, brothers and sisters, and they don't always cry, and they don't always apologize, and they don't always weep, and they don't always make it right. And some of you are left with the consequences and the carnage of what somebody else did to you. And I'm not just talking about something as childish as two saints having a little squabble in the church. No, I'm talking about this great crowd of people. The law of averages would say that there are people in here that when some of you were little children, you were misused and abused in ways that defy description. And some of you, just the mention of abuse brings back a flood of memories, sights and sounds and even horrendous smells and and you just can't get it. And you're possessed by that and you've got this burden over you. Somebody trespassed. Do they owe you? Oh yes they do. Are they going to pay? Doubtful. This is a sinful world. So now you have a choice to make. And here's your choice. Wait a minute. I'm a child of the king. I got a kingdom to be part of. I am not going to spend the rest of my life dealing with that. I'm going to rip it up, throw it away, tear it up. You say, but but, 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 but Brother Woodward, I can't forget. Nobody asked you to. Jesus didn't ask you to forget. He asked you to forgive. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice. You may feel the same for the rest of your life. God didn't promise you'd feel different when you forgave them. Here's what he promised. If you'll handle it the way I told you to handle it, I will take even that that happened to you when the devil tried to destroy you through other people. I will take that and I will work it together for good. You won't even see it coming, but someday you're going to turn around, look back down the road and say, oh my goodness, God even took that that the devil tried to use. God even took that that they did to me and used it to bless me. It's the only PS on the end of the Lord's Prayer. Jesus said, for if you forgive men their trespasses, Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So brothers and sisters, this is very serious. If you won't forgive them, then God is not obligated to forgive you because you're not obeying the terms of the contract. I love this great apostolic movement. I love our churches, our pastors, our saints the great men and women of God who serve us and lead us, the great men and women of God that are part of our churches and support their pastors, push the kingdom forward and give to missions and pray for missionaries. What an incredible movement the apostolic movement is. What a privilege it is to be part of the church of Jesus Christ. What a privilege that is. But if you travel a little bit in this great movement, here's what you'll find. There are many people. It's not God messing them up. It's not even the devil messing them up. It's not even themselves messing them up. It's what somebody else did to them. Do you understand there are people that walk into a service and the song leader or the pastor will say, everybody lift your hands and worship God. And their hands stay at their sides and it's not because they're rebellious. It's because they're hurting. It's because they're burdened. It's because somebody else did something to them and they just can't seem to get by it. My brother or my sister, here's the deal from the scripture. I didn't say this. Jesus said this. You've got to forgive. But I can't. Yes, you can because Jesus told you you could. Paul didn't write, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. He did not write that sitting on a mountaintop in a church service feeling the blessing of God. He wrote that from a prison cell. I can get through this. I can do anything, all things, through Christ, which strengthen me. If Jesus asks you to forgive them, you can forgive them. Here's your problem. Here's your problem. You're waiting for the feeling to kick in. The feeling may never kick in. 
God didn't ask you to feel different about it. He asked you to forgive. Forgiveness isn't getting a new feeling. The king didn't get a new feeling. He just tore up the debt and said, I'm going to act as though it didn't even happen. I'm carrying on with my life. I'm a king. I got a kingdom to run. I'm going to do better things in my future than sit around and worry about what they did to me in my past. Hold your hand out like this and grip it just as tight as you've ever gripped it and then go like that. Here's what you do with a trespass. You release it. You play hot potato with that. You just get it out of your spirit, out of your heart, out of your mind, out of your thoughts, out of your life. You say, but it keeps coming back. Then do it again every day, every morning, every church service if you need to. But you have a right to lift up your hands and worship God with freedom and abandon. You don't have to be burdened down by what they did. Somebody can walk out of Bible class this morning. You walked in here all bowed over, but Jesus would say, stand up and be free what they did is inconsequential let it go release it let it go release it let it go release it and walk out of here free I wish you'd lift up your hands and your voice I'm almost done but I wish you'd just let a response from your spirit It would change so many churches if a couple of families, a couple of saints, a couple of elders could just let go of something that somebody else did. If they never apologize, let go of it. If they never ask for forgiveness, release it. You need to get it out of your spirit because you're better than that. You're a child of the king. Uh, I'm paying attention to the clock but I wish my intercessors would just lift up your voice right now and I wish you'd do what you do in the Holy Ghost you don't have to wait on us you don't have to hold back for us I wish my intercessors would just let, let loose in the Holy Ghost this is Louisiana there's 105 years of prayer you have a right to be free you have a right to have your joy back you have a right to have your peace back and the answer is in your hands you got to handle it right release that get rid of it get it out of your heart get it out of your spirit I don't care if they're 100% wrong you don't deserve to be bound up by that for the rest of your life let go of it Because if you do, God said, I'll even use that, that they did to you for your good. (coughs) Stand with me, would you please? You say, Brother Woodward, I've honestly searched my heart. I've searched my heart. I've even searched my heart while you've been teaching this morning. And I can honestly say, I'm not being arrogant or I'm I'm not being smug or boastful, but I can honestly say I've searched my heart. And I don't think there's a a, a trouble that I got myself into that I need to repent of. Now, I've repented many times, but today I don't think that's the issue. And I can honestly say, searching my heart, I, I don't think it's a temptation. I don't think it's the devil trying to get me off track. I don't think that's what it is today. And I'm searching my heart. I'm honest before God. I I don't even think it's a trespass that somebody else did against me that I need to release. I, I don't think it's that. Then my brother or my sister, God has honored you and privileged you. He has enough confidence in you that he has allowed you to walk into a time of trial. Trials do not come from others. Trials do not come from your mistakes. Trials do not come from the devil's temptations. Trials are actually allowed by God's hand. He does not create them, but he allows them and he uses them. And if you've looked around and you can't see any of the other circumstances in your life right now, then dear saint of God, dear pastor, friend of mine, you are in a time of trial. It has been allowed by God. Now here's what you've got to understand. If God allowed it, God's going to use it. 
and even this time of trial will work together for good. There's only one right biblical response to trials. And we learn it from the most unlikely person in the most unlikely place. It's from the Apostle Paul. In the last chapter of the last book that he'll ever write on this planet to a church. He's in a jail cell on death row. He's there unjustly and he can't figure out why God would silence his voice from preaching the gospel and allow him to be in a jail cell. But here's what Paul writes from the prison. And here's how you need to handle your time of trial. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Here's how you handle a trial. Lift up your hands and just say, God, I don't understand. I don't like it, but I'm going to rejoice in the middle of it because here's my confidence. Here's God's guarantee. All things work together for good. Would you take somebody else by the hand and push that hand up into the heavens with your hand? And could we make one huge prayer meeting all across this place? If you need to repent for a trouble that you cause, repent. If you need to resist the devil, resist him and get out of that temptation. If you need to release somebody, get yourself free of that trespass. But if you're in a trial, lift up your head and rejoice in the Lord. God has a purpose and a plan. It's going to be okay. All things work together for good.
Why don't you just put your hand on the person beside you? And one more time, can we just pray for our brother and our sister right now? There's a deep move of the Spirit in this place right now. I believe healing can take place all over this house. Come on, you don't know what your neighbor's facing today. I feel very fitting on a day of freedom that somebody would leave here being set free by whatever hurt, by whatever pain. You may have carried it in today, but you don't have to carry it out in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we give you praise. Could you clap your hands unto the Lord? Oh, let's clap it. Let there be a mighty ovation for what God is doing in this place. Hallelujah. What a tremendous word from the Lord but but I want you to look around and look at what a tremendous crowd here in a day session amen let's give God praise for a full floor people in the balcony amen isn't God good it was our former president Ronald Reagan that said freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction we didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. The same is true for our apostolic faith. And I am so excited to know that there is another generation that still holds to the Word of God. This great crowd is a testimony that the church is alive and well. Anybody thankful to be a part of the church? Oh, hallelujah. Amen. We're going to ask our ushers to come. Amen. You can be seated. We've got a couple of things we need to take care of. We're going to go right back into worship here momentarily. But as the ushers are coming, we want to give you a chance to give. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. We want to remind you of a couple of quick announcements. And that is tonight's schedule. Tonight is missions night. And we're going to be blessed by the ministry of evangelist Mark Drost, who's going to be preaching the word of the Lord. You do not want to miss tonight's service. It's going to be a powerful time in the Lord. Also tonight, the Louisiana District Youth is hosting Fourth Fest, and that will be as well as their service tonight. That's going to be held at the Pentecostals of Alexandria at 7 p.m. The speaker tonight will be Brother Victor Jackson. And following the evening service, Fourth Fest will be located in the GA Mangan Center at the POA admission will be $10 at the door and will include food and entertainment. Also tonight, Lighthouse Ranch for Boys will be here for a pre-service presentation at 6 p.m. Also, for those of you with small children, Kid Zone is being held at, uh, starting at 9.30 a.m. daily under the pavilion. Registration is $10 per day. Also, be, please be sure to visit the Louisiana District Bookstore and Pentecostal Publishing House for books, CDs, and DVDs. I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of services that you're going to want to purchase at the conclusion of this week. Also, the Cecil Daniel Center is available for nursing mothers and children from birth to three years of age. If you're taking a child to the center, we just simply ask that the chaperone, chaperone be over 18 years of age. This is located out of the back of the tabernacle beyond the pavilion. We also ask that you please respect our local businesses and restaurants. There's many pastors who pastor in this area. We want to be a light to this community and leave a good reputation. So please tip generously, be courteous, and above all, just smile. God's people should smile. Look at your neighbor and say, smile. Amen. We're going to go back into worship here. We're going to sing and, and magnify the name of the Lord at the conclusion of that. Uh, Pastor Robert Tisdale is going to be preaching for us. Didn't he bless us last night? What a word from the Lord. God, as we get ready to worship, I wish you'd just stand back to your feet. 
Amen. And would you lift your hands toward heaven? And would you one more time lift up the name of Jesus? God, bless this offering. Bless this worship. We receive your word in Jesus' name.
Put your hands in the air and give him praise all over this house. Go ahead, shout hallelujah. Let it echo out of your soul right now. Without words to adequately describe or define him, would you do it? Just say hallelujah. Do it again, hallelujah. What a special presence of God is in the house of the Lord this morning. Anytime we stand before the Lord with humility and clean hearts, repentance, the presence of God always flows powerfully. Thank you. I'm not sure what to call him, Raymond Woodward, evangelist, pastor high potentate I'm not really sure thank you for that amazing word of God today beautiful beautiful you are a gift to the apostolic movement thank you so very much I must tell everyone in this house what an honor it was last night to be asked by Bishop Cox and the camp meeting committee to minister communion to all of you wonderful people. I consider it a privilege and an honor because of what I believe is happening today, last night, and will happen over the continuing course of this camp meeting. For last night, as we took communion together, we refreshed a covenant. We revived a contract and there are benefits that come from that contract and then Raymond Woodward so eloquently took us into the word of the Lord to clean our hearts to lay down our offenses God is getting us ready for the ministry that continues with Mark Drost for an outpouring of the miraculous with Jack Cunningham with the power of the Holy Ghost and I'm convinced in fact I prophesy over this house there will be a divine release of supernatural healing and deliverance and you will not leave this camp meeting the way you came I echo the words uh, of Bishop Cox that God's going to do something unique and supernatural before this week's over will you agree with that in a little worship right now Lord, do it. Let it be done in the name of Jesus. I have come this morning to fan the embers of your faith. To blow a fresh wind upon those coals. I've come to declare the active and living word of God. All things are possible to them that believe. Nothing is impossible and I am asking God before this day is finished to give you a fresh impartation of faith and belief look at your neighbor and say God can fix your brain now, now say it like this as you return to your seats say it like this you ready say it like this say God can fix your brain one more time just because it feels so good make sure you pick out someone special this time look at them and say God can fix your brain and you may be seated A particular neuroscientist by the name of Andrew Newberg has made it his life's pursuit to study the brain and the phenomenon of God and his effects upon that brain. And Mr. Newberg in several of his research papers and books has come to this consensus and I quote, if you contemplate God long enough, something surprising happens in your brain. Neural functioning 
begins to change. Different circuits become activated while other circuits become deactivated. New dendrites, that is the movement of thought process through the veins of communication. New dendrites are formed and new synaptic connections are made. The brain becomes more sensitive to subtle realms of experience. I'm still quoting. Perceptions alter. Beliefs begin to change. And if God has meaning for you, then God becomes neurologically real. Hmm. In fact, the research team at the University of Pennsylvania has consistently demonstrated that God is part of our consciousness. And the more you think about God, the more you will alter the neural circuitry in specific parts of your brain. So let me say it very clearly. God can change your brain. Because the more you contemplate God, the more mysterious he becomes. Quoting again, some embrace this emergent ambiguity and some are frightened by it. Some ignore it and others reject it in its entirety. But the fact remains that every human brain from childhood on, contemplates the possibility that spiritual realms exist. Again, I'm quoting Mr. Newberg. Believers like Isaac Newton, agnostics like Charles Darwin, and atheists like Richard Dawkins have all given serious consideration to humanity's fascination with God. Now listen to this. We have discovered a particular neuron. Once activated, it cannot be deactivated. We call it the God neuron. The moment God is introduced to the human brain, the neurological concept will not go away. If I was you, I'd start meditating on God. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law of the Lord doth he meditate. If I was you, I'd start focusing on God a little bit because it opens up pathways, neural connections in your brain that have lying dormant. And when you start focusing on the goodness of God, when you start contemplating the greatness of his majesty, something shifts. It was just another day, like any other day, the sun rose, the dew upon the plants. And yet, this young man who was called upon to be taxed that day seems to be a young man that spent his early life contemplating God more than others. Opening up these neural pathways to what could be possible. Challenging the status quo and what was unlikely. Let me give you a tip. Spend more time thinking about God and less time worrying about what can go wrong. Just spend a little more time focusing on God and His greatness and less time focusing on the chaotic manifestations in and around your life. Just speak of His majesty. Declare His wondrous works and let God change your brain. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Simply put, it matters what you think about. I'll quote Mr. Newberg again. If you contemplate something as complex or mysterious as God, you're going to have incredible bursts of neural activity firing in different parts of your brain. I'd like to engage your brain today. Some of y'all really need me to. <laughs> Just kidding, I couldn't resist. Sorry. Again, Mr. D Mr. Newberg says, new dendrites rapidly glow and old associations disconnect as new imaginative perspectives emerge. That sounds a little bit like faith. In essence, when you think about God, your brain begins to grow. 
Lions, bears, sheep, all part of a normal routine for a boy named David. This day began like others, but something shifted. Something was different. Jesse said, I need you to deliver a lunch. Simple enough, but an errand that would disrupt his day would change his life. David had an errand in mind. God had an anointing in mind. Someone in this house, God's about to interrupt your routine. Has anyone ever started a day and it turned out different than you planned? Different than how it was supposed to go. You see, most of our days introduce us to battles we don't choose. David thought he was just delivering lunch, just doing a chore, and headed home. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 21 tells us the story. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper and ran to the army and came and saluted his brethren. Hello, what's happening? And as he talked with them, behold, there came the champion of the Philistines of Gath. Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines. And he spake according to the same words and David heard him. And all the men of Israel saw him, fled, and were sore afraid. That's pretty scared. Sore afraid. Afraid so much it makes your body hurt. Anybody ever been there? So frightened you couldn't sleep at night. So frightened it stole the peace from your mind and the tranquility from your spirit. So afraid that all you could think about was the negativity and the fear that tore you up. For the writer would tell us that fear hath torment. They are tormented by the threats of a giant because of the fear of what he will do to them. I've come to slay some fear with you today. But watch what happens. And the men of Israel said, hey, little boy, have you seen the giant? That's verse 25. But the man who killeth him. The king will make him rich, and he will give him his daughter, and he'll make his father's house free from taxes. And David said, what happens to the guy that kills the guy? What what did you just say? What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine? You you mean, you, you, you get to marry his girl? You get riches? And your family's future is secure if I slay this giant? Yeah, that's what's going to happen. So I get the girl. I get the money. And I get the future for my family. Not to mention I get to take the reproach off of God. You know, David, it says, and taketh away the reproach. David got insulted Because of the assault on God's glory. Some of you need to get a little righteous indignation about the attack on God. Rather than the offense toward you. We focus a lot on what's wrong in our lives. But maybe we ought to get a little upset about the reproach it brings to the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, everyone has a nemesis. You just don't fight things when you initiate them. We fight giants as they come to us. David did not go to Gath. Gath sent its giant to David. Israel, as an army, was prepared to fight an army. But Israel was not prepared to fight a giant. You know, it's amazing if you put us in a different environment for what we're not prepared for, sometimes we're intimidated. Israel was sore afraid as brother Woodward put it you have to decide to fight because there are benefits to winning this fight riches the wife and no more taxes you break the curse on your family you set free your lineage you set up deliverance so who is 
This uncircumcised Philistine that would defy the army. Let me make it plain, Louisiana camp meeting. Something is defying your future. Something is denying you of your destiny. And David has a resistance to accept what other people listen to and run from. What you believe is a result of what you think upon. What you contemplate. Some of you need to open up a new pathway of thought by hearing the right words. You need to hear that all things are possible for them that believe. You need to hear, greater is he that's in me. You need to hear that you're the head and not the tail. That you're above and not beneath. That you're blessed going in and blessed coming out. Faith cometh by hearing. Israel saw a giant and said he's too big to defeat. But David saw a giant and said he's too big to miss. You have to change your perspective by what you focus on and what you think about. Because David knows innate within him, he is a child of destiny. He doesn't know when or how it will be unleashed, but he believes this is not all there is for me. David has an anointing, but David has not had an opportunity. He has been anointed to be king, but not given the pathway to be a king. You need to say it over your own life. Say, there is a king inside of me. Say it like you mean it. Say, there's an anointing inside of me. Say it again. Say, there's a king inside of me. It sometimes feel odd to think there's anything other than you than an errand boy. Have you ever had a ridiculous dream you couldn't impart to anyone because it was so crazy? A crazy idea about what could be possible, but no one believed you if you told them. It's crazy to think someone like you would dare to think someone like that. But think with me for a moment. If David doesn't deliver the lunch, David misses the vehicle that will propel him to the kingship of Israel. Can I say it this way? Don't skip the process. Don't miss the thing that leads you to the thing. Because small things lead to big things. And if you're not faithful in the process, you will miss your promise. What if David tells dad, Jesse, no, I will not deliver the cheese. I'm bigger than that. It's beneath me. I don't believe God to be a gopher boy. I'm believing God to be a king. I'm not a parking attendant. I'm not a usher. I'm not a security team. I'm not a Sunday school team. I'm a preacher. You, you don't understand who I am. But if David doesn't deliver the lunch, David misses the blessing. Because timing is everything in the plan of God. You can't despise the day God begins you with a small beginning. Because if he is not faithful to deliver the food, he misses the promise and the possibility. That's why you do everything with excellence. That's why we worship with excellence. We pray with excellence. We serve with excellence. We give with excellence. That's why some never become what God had designed for them to become because we're impatient. We're arrogant. We can't walk through the process. Don't get mad when you're asked to do something below your destiny. Don't be mad when your place at the church feels like a dead end place. Get your mind right. Stop talking. Hush your mouth. Because where you are right now may not be your destiny. It's just the details to the destiny. It's just the process to your purpose. So if you do the details with excellence and consistency, God will open a door of deliverance and anointing for your life. I'll be honest with you. The first church wasn't my destiny. My first church was my test. And you got to pass the test. God wants to see if you'll be faithful in doing what doesn't feel gratifying to you. What feels beneath you. Where you are right now doesn't line up to your future, but it is a significant part of your future. Every person and every believer in this house must pass two tests. Raymond Woodward isn't the only one with cool graphics. And the first test is this, obscurity. Can you pass the test of obscurity? When no one recognizes you and no one knows your name 
and no one remembers you, although you've met them a dozen times. And you reintroduce yourself each camp meeting. And they stare at you if they've never shook your hand before. Can you pass obscurity? When you labor alone, when no one's receiving the spirit in your church, when your kids in the Sunday school class are not adapting the principles of the word you teach but seem to become more rebellious, can you handle when there's no affirmation or accolades and acknowledgement of your ministry? Can you handle obscurity? Because the believer who can't handle obscurity will make wrong moves based on wrong motives. And we will impatiently move ministries based on feelings. We will walk away, we will quit, we will be subdued, we will surrender because we cannot handle the loneliness of ministry without accolades. But we don't serve God for affirmation of people. We serve the king that we might please the king because he has been so good to us. So we don't impatiently move frustrated because we see no results. Hear me clearly. Luke never is recorded to have preached a sermon. Luke was not there during the miracles. But if Luke doesn't have a pen in his hand writing the book of Acts, you and I do not have the understanding that we are to repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, and receive the gift of the Spirit. Stephen only preaches one sermon. And that one sermon causes his death as the teeth bite and the rocks fly. But if it is not for that sermon, the Apostle Paul would not say, I was there when I held the coats of that man. It was the death of Stephen that transformed the life of Paul. Hear me clearly. You don't need anyone to recognize your ministry as long as God sends you. The second test is notoriety, prominence. We get promoted too high and we lose humility. We become unsubmitted to authority. We have no voice of veto in our life. We answer to no one and our spiritual gifts become reckless because we believe that our pathway to his authority and his voice makes us beyond correction. I remember the day, Pastor Mangan come. I didn't have a pastor. I had a circle of elders around me. I asked Pastor Mangan a little advice. And he said, my voice won't compete with others. Brother Tenney told me to ask you this, who's your pastor? I said, well, I moved every year to my whole life. I never developed a deep relationship with a man of God. I don't really have a pastor. He said, I'm asking you, am I your pastor? I thought within my mind, I've never called a man pastor like he's asking me to call a man pastor. I've said the word pastor many times, but I've never submitted my life as a man of God to another man of God and say, whatever you says is right and not what I say. And he sat there waiting for an answer from me that raged like an internal battle because I was a little nervous to call a man pastor. And give a man veto power over my ministry, my future, or my direction. But I want to say it very clearly in this house. Every man and woman of God, every Sunday school teacher, every prophet, every apostle, every bishop. You hear me clearly. Someone has to be in your life that has veto power. The ability to say you're out of line, your spirit's wrong. You need to humble yourself before God. You need to repent of your sins sins you are not above correction the bible said the way we know we're a bastard or not is whether we receive correction every one of us in this room we need a man of god in our life that we will say whatever you say pastor just put your hand right there because every believer must pass the test of notoriety When you answer your call to ministry, you choose a path and not a destination. Can I say it again? And I'm speaking not just to ministry, but every saint in this house right now. When you answer your call to ministry, because we're all ministers, you choose a path and not a destination. You allow God to lead you. You don't tell God where you're going. Because the destination 
is relative to the path. And if you determine the destination, you're not following. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. There are only two choices with the plan of God. You cooperate with God's purpose or you resist. And when you choose a path, you say, God, you have permission to lead me. You're saying, God, you know best with my life and my purpose. When you choose a destination, you're saying, I know best. The Israelites heard intimidation. David hears opportunity. The Israelites heard defeat. David hears the ringing of victory and deliverance. It truly matters what you focus on and what you listen to. David realizes I have a chance to live another type of life. I can be free. My family can be free. I can change my destiny. No more pastures and no more sheep. But it's unique to me. As his faith rises and his courage finds voice, his older brother treats him with disdain. What are you doing here? I know the naughtiness of your heart. You're just a baby. You're not in this army. Go home. You have no uniform, no sword, no horse, no shield, no armor. You're not qualified. But remember, if David kills Goliath, he gets it all. Because killing the giant will change how your story ends. Killing the giant will open up new doors for you. Killing the giant will change your family situation. Killing the giant will release the nation. Killing the giant will free your church. I'm convinced that there is something standing between all of us and what God knows and wants for us. We just have to kill the giant. Because there is a giant from Gath that has positioned himself to keep you from the next level of your anointing. But the older brother plays a significant role. You see, it's unique to all of our situations that it seems as each time we're ready to do something great, there's always someone to remind us we can't do it. Who are you? You little boy. You can't write a book. You can't lead a song. You can't teach a class. You can't lead prayer. And this insult does not come from the giant. Because we can take insults when they come uh, from giants. This criticism comes from the same person you came to bring your lunch to. This attack came from the people you are sent to serve. How can they eat your lunch and talk against your destiny? Hear me clearly. There will always be people who resist your anointing. Who fight against your calling. Who push against your purpose. Don't get angry. Don't get vindictive. Don't allow bitterness to enter in. Because Eliab is only related to your history. Not your destiny. Eliab wants to keep David where he sees David. The sheep are calling you little boy. Go back home to what you're good at. Because there is always someone willing to remind you of your place and your lack of experience. And quite honestly, it's so much easier to be what Eliab declares us to be. Go ahead and go home today. Go be what you've always been. Play the role which you are familiar. Who's doing your job when you're here? I know the pride and naughtiness of your spirit. You'll only watch us win. You have nothing to contribute. You're just a spectator. And this is not Goliath attacking him. Sometimes you have to fight who you're related to. Sometimes you have to fight to the people you serve. Sometimes you have to fight spiritual connections. Perhaps I should quote my neuroscientist again. Religious and spiritual contemplation changes your brain in a profoundly different way because it strengthens the unique neural circuit that specifically enhances social awareness and empathy while subduing destructive feelings and emotions. That sounded pretty good for a scientist, didn't it? So how about I quote it in a common vernacular. Thinking about God 
opens up compassion in your spirit and enhances your ability to love while subduing negative and destructive emotions. You're focusing on the brother too much when you ought to be focused on the God that's going to give you power to defeat the giant. David stepped into a battle he never chose and his love for God picked a fight. His worship for his God picked a fight. Let me tell you, some of you need to pick a fight with a giant because he has limited your church, hindered the people in your congregation, limited your family, fought your lineage. They're addicts, they're broken, they're envious, they're jealous, they're bitter, they're angry. And it's time some apostolic stood on his feet and said, what is this giant that brings a reproach on my past, on my family, on my parents, on my loved ones. You don't get to pick the devil you're fighting. Devils are assigned to us. And every time you get ready to fight, there's some critical little imp saying, hey, you know you can't do it. You know you can't win. You know you can't become it. Don't put your judgments of your own fear on someone else's life. Don't put your fear that God can't do it for you so you're going to put it on someone else. I'm going to quote again from Mr. Newberg. Tell your neighbor, say, God can change your brain. Watch this. You ready? Watch. Because I want you to hear this one if you heard no other quotation. Anger interrupts the functioning of your frontal lobe. Wow. Wow. Stop picking up other people's anger. It's not even your fight. Stay out of it. Because anger interrupts the functioning of your frontal lobe. Watch this. I'm quoting. Not only do you lose the ability to be rational, you lose the awareness that you're acting in an irrational way. When you get mad in traffic and anger flares, it shuts down your frontal lobe. You have no ability then to think rationally. This ought to put a whole new spin on your marital spats. You shut down the ability to think rationally. And not only do you lose the ability to think rationally, here's what happens. You lose the ability to realize you're acting irrationally. So not only are you crazy, you don't even know you're crazy. Not only are you Acting like a petulant child stomping your foot. You know what? You don't even know you're acting that way because you have shut down the part of the brain that controls emotional reactivity. Grow up. Pray through. Let God fix your brain. Watch this. You're not going to like this next quotation. When your frontal lobe shut down, It's impossible to listen to the other person. No wonder I'm always right. I'm going to read it again because you think it's funny. And it is, sort (laughs) of. When your frontal lobe shut down, remember, anger cuts off the blood flow. You say, how do they get all this stuff? They've been taking pictures and diagnoses of brains and scanning their brains with blood flow, watching how they think over the course of almost 30 years. And this is the culmination of their research on the brain. When you get angry, you shut down the frontal lobe. There's no blood flow. The frontal lobe is what causes you to be compassionate. Remember the quote before this? This is what causes you to feel empathy and love, to connect with other people. And when you get mad, you shut it down and when you shut it down then you can't love people you can't be compassionate and not only can you not be compassionate you don't even know you're not being compassionate because you're filled with anger and listen when your frontal lobe shuts down it's impossible to listen to other people let alone feel empathy or compassion and he goes on instead you are likely to feel self-justified and self-righteous I really would like to drop the mic right now. And when that happens, the communication process falls apart. That's what he said. Watch this. Anger releases a cascade of neurochemicals that actually, watch, destroy. Somebody said destroy. The parts of the brain that control emotional stability. And when you get angry, 
Not only can you not think clear, you're killing your own brain. You're killing the ability to think clearly and rationally and have stability. You know, I've discovered it's easy to act like Jesus. Feed the poor. Be compassionate. Be peaceful. But it's really hard to react like Jesus. When people are beating you and cursing you and lying about you and manipulating you, it's hard to turn the other cheek and not rail upon them that rail on you. But according to Mr. Newberg, when you intensely and consistently focus on your spiritual values and goals, you increase. Did you hear? i got to slow that one down. When you intensely, say intensely, and consistently focus on your spiritual values and goals, you increase the blood flow to your frontal lobe and anterior cingulate, which causes the activity in the emotional centers of your brain to decrease. So what happens then when the blood flow hits it, you stop acting irrationally and begin to act rationally. Anger is killing us. Men ought everywhere. Lifting up holy hands without wrath. We like to talk about what our ladies are called to a lot, but how about what our men are called to? Men ought everywhere. We ought to have a praise in our mouth and a hands raised toward heaven. A surrendered spirit. You're called men to be a worshiper everywhere you go. You're called to be a light to a dark world everywhere you go. Because men ought everywhere with holy hands lifted up toward heaven. You are first called to be a worshiper. The distinction of the apostolic should not be the way our women look. It ought to be the way our men worship. It ought to be the way our men go up. That's what Bathsheba said when she saw how the men went up the breath left her body you ought to be leading this congregation in worship and celebration if you're a man men ought everywhere with holy hands anger is decapitating the power of God in our lives with holy hands without wrath You're called to be a worshiper. You're called to have a clean spirit, clean motives, clean agenda. And you're called to have no anger. The trademark of a blood-bought, Holy Ghost-filled, water Jesus name baptized is you ought to be a man of peace, not a war. A man of love and compassion. Not anger, not criticism, not ugliness, not agendas and not motives that suit you. Not filled with self. I'm called to live without wrath. God help my spirit. God fix my breath. I'm asking you right now, God. You can kill Goliath with rocks, but you should not throw rocks at your brother. What do you do when who you were sent to serve is fighting you? Limiting you. Resisting you. Aggressively pursuing your demise, criticizing you, not validating you. What do you do when those God sent you to have no appreciation for your ministry, your gifts, or your sacrifice? There's only so much fighting you can do with those you love. What have I done, David said? I'm just doing you a favor. But the truth is, David woke up believing what Eliab said. He was just an errand boy until he sees a giant. The greatest response to a devil is a decision. Didn't we just hear you got to fight? Resist the devil? Push back against him? Because the greatest response to the devil and the giant in your life is a decision. It's not a dance. You don't whip the devil with a dance at church. You don't whip the devil with a song at church. You don't beat him with your talents. You have to make a decision you're going to fight. You have to make a decision that you won't allow him to run roughshod over your family anymore. Is there not a cause? Your future is tied to the decision you make now. Your family is connected to the decision you make right now. The deliverance for your spouse, the self-esteem is connected to it, your success, the favor of God, because your destiny is tied to your devil. And until you decide it's worth the battle, you will not endure what you are supposed to fight. But I don't know about you, I've decided to fight. 
I've decided to whip every devil in Tampa. I've decided to do my best to bring revival to my city. I, I don't know, am I preaching to any saint of God that's so tired of your family being manipulated, sore afraid, vexed at night, vexed in the day, filled with worry and anxiety, fighting discouragement and disease, overcome by the spirit of infirmity? I don't know about you, but let's fight apostolics. Let's stand to our feet and fight. Go ahead, let God start fixing your brain a little bit. Let the Holy Ghost focus on the goodness and the greatness of God. Goliath hurled insults. David hurled faith of the greatness of the God he served. Let this mind which was in Christ Jesus be also in you. You see, what you choose, can I quote Mr. Newberg one last time? Thank you. What you choose to meditate upon or pray for can do more than change your brain. This is a scientist. As far as I know, this dude only had the Holy Ghost. Listen, what you choose to meditate on and pray for can do more than change your brain. You can damage it. Especially if you choose to focus on something that makes you frightened or angry. When you lay awake in your night, postulating the what ifs could go wrong if someone says this, and going through imaginative responses to situations that haven't even materialized, you are damaging your brain. Goodness, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. In psychology, this is called rumination, and it is clearly hazardous to your health. In a Stanford brain study, people who focused on negative aspects of themselves or a negative interpretation of life had increased activity in the emotional center of the brain. Listen, this generated waves of fear, releasing a torrent of destructive neurochemicals into the brain that systematically destroyed their ability to think rationally. But in prayer, as in therapy, we learn to watch our negativity and not react to it. In the process, we train the brain to remain calm even in the face of adversity. So prayer becomes the exemplary way to reevaluate life's difficulties in ministry. It trains the mind to become less attached to its own desires, attachments, and belief. And when this happens, the way we see ourselves and the world will change. Some of you need to speak it over your life. There's a king inside of me. Some of you need to declare it over your life. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. You need to tell yourself, I'm an overcomer by the word of my testimony and the blood of the lamb. You need to say, a thousand will fall on my left and ten thousand on my right. Put your hands in the air and declare God's goodness over yourself. You need to hear it coming out of your own mouth. You need to hear it coming out of your spirit. I got the victory. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say this. Say there's more to me than what you see. Come on, say it again. Say, there's more in me than what you see. I wish you'd celebrate right now. I wish you'd believe you have an anointing on your life to slay a giant. You have an anointing on your life to whip a devil. You have an anointing on your life to be a king. Jesse doesn't believe in him. He picked all the other sons before he picked him. Eliab, the older brother, don't believe in him. His king Saul doesn't believe in him, said, you need all my stuff. And Goliath don't believe in him. But David believes in David. And David believes in the God David saw. Deliver him from the lion. Deliver him from the bear. Some of you need to put your faith in God that is in you. In you is Christ the hope of glory. In you is greater is he than he that's in the world. 
Why don't you shout right now, I believe in the God that's in me. Come on, say it right now. I believe to the God that's in me. Something's about to be loosed in this house. I feel it rising right now. Somebody's calling is about to transcend your circumstance. Somebody's about to say there's a cause bigger than this fight. There's a cause bigger than this battle. When you get tired of the devil ruining your destiny, you'll decide to fight. David believed the calling and the anointing on his life surpassed the conflict. What is stopping you must become less important than the fight in front of you. Your calling must be more valuable than the circumstances or you'll go back to tending sheep. When whatever is in front of you becomes more valuable than what's behind you, you'll fight. Because the cause has to be more important than the circumstances. Listen to me. It's not about how well trained you are, how experienced you are, how many people. Can I say it? Nobody's got to believe in you but your God. You don't have to have a support system. You don't have to get likes on social media. You don't have to get thumbs up and admiration and affirmation. You got to believe in the God that sent you. You come against me with sword and shield, but I come against you in the name. The scriptures that Jesus said, if it's possible, let this shame, let this cup of suffering pass from me. The word said he despised the shame, but for the joy set before him. Because when he looked beyond the pain and saw you and I, he said it's worth death, it's worth the fight, it's worth the whip, it's worth the blood, it's worth the nails. Maybe I need to remind some believers. You don't live for God for yourself. You live for your grandkids. You live for your great grandkids. You live so there'll be an apostolic church in your city. You live so there'll be a Pentecostal revelation in your community. You live. Jeremiah was told to buy the field of his cousin. He said, I don't want to buy the field of my cousin. That's the reason I'm in prison. He said, why would I buy that field? He's lying in prison in a Babylonian imprisonment. And God said, buy the field. He goes, I ain't buying the field. Why buy the field? It's occupied by the Babylonian army. And God said, you buy the field from the man that betrayed you. Why? Because this, there will be houses. There will be vineyards. There will be prosperity in again this land later. You don't buy this thing for yourself you don't get in this thing just to get deliverance on your own you fight because every devil you beat today is one less your family's got to fight tomorrow you whip your Goliath now and if you can whip your anger it won't be perpetuated into your kids My daddy's daddy committed suicide. My daddy's mama died when he was eight years old. My daddy wrestled anger. My daddy wrestled depression. But by the grace of God and the blood of the cross, I don't fight depression. I beat that a long time ago. I put anger at the cross. I took on my gloves. I stepped up to the plate. You know why I want to beat it? I want to beat it so I'm free. But I really want to beat it so my daughter who is 16 and my boy who is 13 don't have to fight that despair and that ache. I wish you'd win right now. I wish you'd decide to fight. Let me tell you something. You won't fight. You will not fight until you believe what the cause is greater than the fight. And number two, you will not fight until you believe what you have is more than enough. 
You will not fight your devil until you believe what you have is enough. You ever wondered why Jesus put that verse in there that said you have not because you ask not? Why wouldn't you ask? You may not come up to me, Bishop Cox, and ask me for a million dollars today. You probably wouldn't because you think I don't have it. Or maybe you think I wouldn't give it to you if I did have it because I don't like you. Because we make all sort of incorrect assumptions. So not only might you think you might not get it because I don't have it or I wouldn't give it to who you are, you might think I'm the kind of person that wouldn't release it. There's really only three reasons you don't ask God for the power to defeat this devil. You don't believe he's got the power. You don't believe he'll lend you the authority. You ready? Or you don't believe you're worth being lent the authority. Until you decide what you have is more than enough. I've heard all kind of theories. I almost said silly, but I did it. About why he picked up five smooth stones. I have no idea. It's no theological revelation. But I know this. He only needed one. I don't know why I picked up five, but I know what God told him. You don't even need all your gifts to get rid of this devil because you'll have something left over after you've fought this giant. You will not be depleted of your resources. You will not be depleted of your strength. You will win this battle and you'll have something left over. I'm telling someone in this house, the devil you're going to defeat this week, it will not leave you depleted. It will not leave you empty. It will not leave you broken. But you're going to win and you're going to have something left over. You go have go ahead. I'll preach with it. I got a black church. I'm trying to shut it down, but I just got to get somebody in Louisiana camp to make up their mind to whip a devil before Friday night. Satan knows what you have is more than enough to win this battle. The rock should have never worked. The sling should have never been effective. It's not how good we preach. It's not how good our programs are and how great our music is. It's the God in the music, the God in the preaching, the Holy Ghost in us. I want you to shout till your Goliath hears you. I want you to shout till every devil in your family hears you. I want you to shout till every demon is fearful of you. Come on, go ahead, let it out. Let it out. Come on, go ahead, go ahead. There is an anointing on every person in this house to slay their giants. There is an anointing on every one of you to have the victory. You've been waiting on the opportunity to be a king. You have the anointing to be a king. I'm going to tell you what takes you from the pasture to the palace. In 24 hours, he went from a shepherd boy to songs being sung about his name. Saul slew his thousands, but David is ten thousands. God can turn your circumstance overnight. What's going to elevate your anointing? What's going to elevate your calling and your ministry? Is when you step up and defeat the lust, the anger, the anger, the forgiveness, the bitterness, the frustration. I want you to put your hands in the air and say it. I'm here to fight. Now say this. Say what God gave me is enough. You know why you say that? Because you better hear the sound of victory coming out your own mouth. You need to say it right now. I come against you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, go ahead. You heard it earlier. Rebuke Satan. Rebuke and resist him. Aggressively oppose him. Push it right now. In the name of Jesus, say it. By the authority of the Holy Ghost in me. By the dominion and the power of the Spirit. I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight. When I 
count to three, I want you to say it. I want you to get a picture of the resistance that's fighting your family, your church, and your ministry. I want you to put that resistance in your mind right now. Because this is the last time we're going to think about it all week. I want you to put it in your mind right now. The fear, the negativity, the sickness, the disease, the prognosis, the diagnosis, all of it. I want you to put it in your mind right now. I want you to think about how ugly it is. I want you to think about how despairing your condition is. Think about it. Because when I count to three, we're going to say it. We're going to declare it. We're going to shout it. And this is the last time you're going to let anxiety and fear make you sore afraid. This is the last time you're going to focus on it in this camp meeting. This is the last time you're going to give it credence and authority over your emotions. Because your confidence is not in men. Your confidence is in God. When you walk out of this battle, there's going to be a fresh anointing on you. I feel something rising in this house. When you beat this devil, you're going to be stronger. You're going to be prouder. You're going to be happier. You're going to be more anointed. You ready? Here's what you're going to say. I come against you in the name of the Lord. And the power of his might. The authority of the spirit in me. You ready? You're not going to think about it another day. You're not getting in the car and talking to your spouse about it. You're not bringing it into the house of God tonight. You're not going to focus on it another moment. Because you're going to confront it right now. And we're going to hear the sound of victory. You ready? One, two, three. Go ahead. I come against you. In the name of the Lord. Shout your miracle out. Shout your miracle out. Declare your deliverance. Declare your victory. Yes! Coach had shouted, yes! you say it in the name of Jesus till something breaks in the name of Jesus till something changes in the name of Jesus till something shifts Go ahead, change your brain right now. Start declaring the wondrous works of God. Start shifting the parameters of how you think. You don't have to leave here an addict. You don't have to leave here depressed. You don't have to leave here sick. You don't have to leave here fearful. Put your hand on someone right now. I'm only doing this because you pray more intensely about someone else's giant than you do your own. You ready? I want everybody praying for somebody else's victory right now. You're not praying for your own. You're praying for the person you're touching. Say it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I deliver you by the authority of the word of God. I speak strength into you to fight. Strength in you to win. Jesus victory deliverance breakthrough go ahead say I give you glory I give you praise cause my enemy did not triumph I give you glory I give you praise let's let something happen right now
shout been trying to get out all week. But hear me clearly. If you're fighting a giant, won't you put your hand in the air? If there's a giant opposing your destiny and you know it, if there's something in front of you that's limiting what you know God wants you to become, put your hand in the air. And I want you to repeat after me. You ready? By the authority of the name of Jesus, as I walk in the dominion of the Holy Ghost and by the sovereignty of the Word of God, I declare victory, deliverance, freedom over my life. In the name of Jesus, let it be done right now. Go ahead, say, I confront you. I fight you. I confront you. Will crush Satan under my feet.
it. I like it when we worship. But I like it when we praise with purpose. So here's what I want you to know. David went into that battle knowing, not only do I get riches, I get the king's daughter. I get a change of location. I'm going to live in the palace and my family be free from the tyranny and the bondage of their past. Here's what I want you to do. We've been focusing on God, killing some giants. I want you to focus for a moment in your worship on what you get if you win. Your family free from addiction. Your family free from despair. Your community worshiping the Lord. Come on, yeah, that's it. Go ahead, focus on what's gonna happen. Focus on what's gonna happen a little bit right now. Yeah, what's gonna happen in your church? What's gonna happen in your family? What's gonna happen in your marriage? What's gonna happen in you? Come on, go ahead. Praise with that a little bit. Praise with that in your mind. Praise about your fresh anointing. In a, in a brain scan monitor they were watching them and their blood flow and they noticed as they chanted peacefulness came over them put Catholics counting the rosaries and going through their prayers and they noticed peacefulness come over them and then they got the brilliant idea of putting Pentecostals in the same machine and they asked them to speak in tongues and the Pentecostals start speaking in tongues. And a unique phenomenon began to occur. The part of their brain, listen, that produces self-awareness and self-doubt. Fear, torment became inactive. When they were praying in the Holy Ghost, when you speak in tongues, you literally turn off your sense of self. Ha! When you speak in tongues, your brain is incapable of casting doubt into your spirit. When I count to three, open your mouth and talk in tongues. You ready? One, two, three. Yeah. That's how you defeat the 
discovered in that same imaging machine that the part of your brain that controls speech that is active right now with me talking when you talk in tongues the part of your brain that is causing you to talk goes dormant you shouldn't be able to speak when that part goes dormant but when you're talking in tongues that part is turned off because you're not making it up it's not emotionalism you're not thinking it you're not manufacturing it it is God praying through you the hope of glory do it one more time you're ready one two three speak in the spirit Talk in tongues, talk in tongues. We have to identify what a Christian is, what a Christian truly really is. Now, if I were to ask you, hey, brother or sister, what is a Christian or what does the word Christian mean? I'm not going to ask you because I'm afraid you might tell me it means Christ-like. If you tell me the word Christian means Christ-like, all that simply means is you never looked it up. You didn't look in the dictionary or the lexicon. And my mama taught Susie, my sister and I, don't use words you haven't looked up because you might be using the word wrong. So the word Christian does not mean Christ-like. On page 672, column 1, paragraph 3 of the Greek-English lexicon of New Testament words by Joseph Henry Thayer, he said the word Christian is from the Greek word Christianos, and it means follower and worshiper of Jesus Christ. A Christian is somebody who follows and worships Jesus because in reality, we don't know nobody just like Jesus. Jesus Christ has never been duplicated and never been replicated. A follower and a worshiper of Jesus is a Christian. So the Bible says in Matthew 4 and 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You serve the God that you worship. I can hang out with anybody. That's why Evangelist Green, it was a treat to hang out with you. I can hang out with anybody 20 minutes. I will tell you who your God is because you serve the gods you worship. If you worship money, you serve your business or your job or whatever you do to get money. If you worship fashion, you serve clothes. If you worship education, you serve degrees. If you worship knowledge, you serve science. If you worship your body, you serve exercise. If you worship your belly, you serve food. If you worship lust, you serve sex. If you worship getting high, you serve alcohol. If you worship yourself, you serve pride. If you worship sin, you serve the devil. Let me admonish you, worship God and serve Jesus. Jesus is the only legitimate object of worship in the entire world. Though our sins are scarlet, you have made us white as snow. Though our sins are scarlet, you have made us white